on this week's episode, it is almost Halloween, so I figured it is high time to check out the Halloween series and figure out what unanswered questions there are in this film series. And there are plenty on my watch through of the movie. I think I labeled down about 30 some questions, but I've narrowed it down to 13. And for something really special, almost every single question will feature a different location from the film series behind me. On this question, we have the original Michael Myers house. Question number one. In the first film, Michael Myers knows how to drive a car. Since he's been held in Smith's Grove since he was a little kid, how did he learn to drive? This is even partially addressed in the movie as Wynn says that Michael doesn't know how to drive and Loomis posits that someone gave him lessons. Now, since we're broken into several continuity, the answer to this is a little harder than it seems. In the continuity of the first six films, it's an easy answer since it was revealed in part six that Wynn was actually the mastermind of the Thorn cult and was behind Michael is evil in the first place. So it's pretty apparent that he would have prepped him for being out in the world. So the person that would have given him lessons would have been him. So Loomis is actually right and he's talking directly to the person that he's theorizing about. Now, that falls apart when we get to H2O in the 2018 version since Wynn never reappears and there is no Thorn cult. So that's a bit trickier, but it's still not too hard to explain, I think. We have to theorize that Michael wasn't always in the facility and had to be in some sort of automobile from time to time, so it would just be a question of him being observant and watching Loomis or Wynn or whoever the driver was and noting how a car is worked. When we see Myers take the wheel as he escapes, he's not doing too many complicated things outside of steering and pressing the gas to go, which you could just figure out from watching someone. He looks a bit better at it the following day, so you can assume that he worked on it during the evening. Question number two. For this question, we're at the location of the former hardware store from the first film, because we're gonna ask the important question of what was the real deal with what was up with that burglary? So being the timeline guy, this one really bothers me because the whole thing makes no logical sense. Bear with me here. We see Michael outside the school and he's wearing the Shatner. A little while later, all the kids get out of school and we see him again and he still has the mask. So if we figure that school lets out around three o'clock or so and the class that we saw was even the final period or so, then he has the mask no later than 2 p.m. It's even possible that he has it on earlier that day as well when Lori is on her way to school, but we never actually see it on him. But judging from the breathing, he's probably wearing it. Then we see Laurie go home and Annie calls her to tell her that she'll pick her up at 6.30, which we then see. Shortly after, we see the girls drive by the hardware store and it's been broken into and the alarm is still going off and people are standing around outside like this was something that just happened. They even managed to get the alarm off while Laurie and Annie are there, so I find it hard to believe that it wasn't able to be shut off. So the absolute least amount of time that could have elapsed between Michael breaking into this store and this point would have been about four hours or so, although that would probably place the store as being open since it would have had to been in the middle of the day. So either he broke in early in the morning before the store opened and it took the police about six hours to respond and the store was just open all day long with an alarm that was going off that just happened to turn off right when the girls pull up. Or, possibly, it wasn't Michael that broke into that store in the first place. The only things that were stolen were some masks. Not a mask, some masks. Although Michael could have gotten his mask from anywhere. Also stolen were a knife and some rope. We never really see Michael use the rope, so we can't even be sure that he has it in the first place. And let's face it, that knife could have come from his old kitchen. Annie's kitchen, or even stolen from the trucker that he killed. The store probably closed at 6 p.m., was broken into shortly afterwards, and we're seeing the events soon after that. It's really the only way I can figure this time frame out and just lends itself to the dangerous nature of this night, in particular that other thieves and vandals are about. Question number three. For this question, we're actually at the intersection where Ben Schramer got hit. 
he got hit because he carelessly walked out into the road. Um, and the question we're going to ask is about Halloween 2, which upped the violence of the series in a pretty big way. But what was up with the film's most disturbing bit? The kid with the razor blade in his mouth. So back in the day, there was this urban legend that every parent in the world was scared of that stated that someone was going to stick razor blades in kids' candy on Halloween in order to harm them. The fear of that or poisoning the candy was so prevalent that parents would always make sure to check their kids' candy before they ate any. The scene in the movie doesn't actually tie into anything else that's going on and it's seemingly just included to emphasize the mythic qualities of Halloween and the tropes of the night. But what if there was more to it? In respect to the original continuity, we know that there was something bigger happening that night as the Thorn constellation is in the sky, and it's most likely having an effect on more than just Michael. The scrawling of Sam Hain on the blackboard definitely indicates something more than just aimless murder, and the presence of the wild mob outside Meyer's house again seems to indicate some extra happening with the discussion of tribalism. The razor blade scene is just another example of the concept that this particular Halloween is cursed by druids, which doesn't sound scary at all when I say it out loud, but it shows that there is more to fear on this night than just Michael Myers. Question number four. And hey, speaking of part two, what happened to Jimmy? He's kind of set up to be the male lead of the film with his puppy dog eyes towards Lori and it and it sure seems like he's at least going to be important. But then he slips and falls in the blood puddle and knocks himself out and doesn't show up again until later on in the film in a car in which he passes out again. Or or does he die? It's, it's kind of unclear and he's not seen again unless you've seen the TV version in which the character is shown to have survived. But I guess that's debatable if you want to consider that canon. Keep in mind, that's not just an added scene. There were several more scenes with Jimmy looking for Laura, and he doesn't just slip on blood in that version. The blood slip isn't there, and instead Jimmy injures his head when he's knocked back by the explosion. So it's apparent that there were a whole separate set of circumstances in that version. So no, in the theatrical version, his death is absolutely up in the air. And add a comment about there being 10 victims so far seems to indicate that they haven't finished counting the dead. So his death is unconfirmed. Keep in mind that there's also a theory that Jimmy does survive and that he's actually Jamie's dad, although there's not really a lot of evidence towards that. His last name is never actually given, so that's not really a clue. And when Jamie looks at a picture of herself as a baby with her dad, it doesn't really look like him. Granted, there'd be a few year age difference, but not enough to justify that different of a look. Some people have theorized that this might actually be Jimmy's younger brother then, but I think it's more likely that it's a separate character as Laurie doesn't really seem that terribly interested in theatrical version Jimmy anyway. Hell, even TV version seems more relieved that he's alive more than she's in love. As to whether he survived, I'm gonna go ahead and say Yes, mainly because I think the TV version at least showed that they had an interest in the character, and he never really came across Michael, who most certainly would have killed him. He mostly stays out of the action, probably had a concussion, but I'm not in the camp that they got together afterwards, or if they did, he definitely wasn't Jamie's father. Question number five. For this question, we are at the hedge that Michael hides behind, and we're going to ask that question about Halloween 3, which ends on a pretty crazy cliffhanger. So. What most likely happens afterwards? Would the TV commercial even be successful? Not nearly on the level that they say it would. We're shown kids with masks all over the country, but the action of our film is set in California. And it's clear that as Cochran and crew are there that it hasn't begun yet. And he says that the giveaway that would trigger the masks is at nine. So for that to be simulcast across the country, the absolute earliest that it would be is 9 o'clock and as late as midnight on the East Coast. Unless they aired it earlier on the East, but then you'd figure that when kids started dying, there'd be calls and alerts and they'd have to cut the feed. So the fact that the ads were still airing in California kind of rules that out. Then once you eliminate all of the kids whose parents wouldn't let them stay up that late, kids who just didn't want silver shamrock masks, kids who couldn't afford it, kids whose parents wouldn't let them watch a horror marathon on TV, and then take into account the fact that they got it down to one channel, and you see in the movie how they have the kid at the end just switch the channel knob by hand, well, that's because that's how most people changed the channel back then. Remote controls were around, but they really weren't 
that commonplace? Eliminate all the parents and kids that just didn't get up to change the channel or didn't change it in time to catch the full coded message. Oh, and eliminate all the kids that wouldn't actually be wearing their masks because I know the channel said to win the giveaway you had to be wearing it. But would anyone really know? I, I know that I took my costume off the second I walked in the door after getting candy and I sure as hell wasn't sitting around the house later just watching movies in it. And besides, um, now we know how people feel about wearing a mask and tell them that they have to. Stop it! 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 Question number six. For this question, I'm actually at Lori's house, but I don't have a pumpkin to sit with, but I think we'll be okay. Because we're talking about Halloween 3, which actually famously didn't feature Michael Myers, but can it be in the same continuity? Well, it appears as if the makers of the original six at least gave it a shot, so I guess so will I. You see, there's a couple of links, tenuous as they may be, and although I think that they're not connected, I'm gonna make a case that they are. Because making stuff up to cover holes in movies is my jam. First of all, you have the Druid connection and Sawain, which was first introduced in the second movie, and of course elaborated on in four, five, and six, primarily in six. When that film introduces the Druid cult of Thorn that exists to, I guess, generate evil energy through Halloween or something, it opens the possibility that Cochrane was a member, or at least a member of an offshoot cult with the same intentions. If there's one druid cult in Illinois stirring up troubles, there's more than likely another one in California up to something similar. And when I say something similar, I mean that one's using constellations to create a soulless killer on Halloween, while the other's using Stonehenge to make masks turn kids' heads into bug factories. So you know, similar. As further evidence that the cults are connected, early in part three, a Mrs. Blankenship is referenced, and do you think that she might be connected to the druids? Right you are, Ken. Of course, there's also a Mrs. Blankenship in part six, and she's revealed to be a cult member. So there's the possibility that this is the same person, and Miss B was connected to both plots, with about 15 or so years between them. If the two universes are connected, I think you could assume that they were successful in shutting down the third station and stopping Cochrane's plan, or at least limiting it to the point that there wasn't a huge tragedy, since something like that would have been a national event that would most likely at least be talked about in future Halloweens, but no one seems to mention it or have any concern about masks. Now, the only thing that interferes with this is the watching of Halloween on the TV that they're watching, insinuating that the movie is just fiction in this universe, but it's also possible that someone made a film version of Michael's escapades in-universe much like the Stab films in Scream. It seems a little weird to no one to mention it though in the next couple of movies, especially when Michael shows back up, like saying, hey, it's the guy from that movie, but it's also possible that the film version just wasn't that successful, even if it was an awesome movie. You know, like Halloween 3. Happy Halloween. Question number seven. On this question, we're actually in the alleyway where Michael overhears Loomis talking to the sheriff, bragging about how many times he shot him. And Halloween 4 brought back Michael in a big way revealing that he survived the ending of part two. But the question is, how does he have eyes? In the end of part two, Michael has both of his eyes shot out so that he's blind and is blown up and burnt to a crisp. Now he's survived gunshots before and has shown to be able to take a rather large amount of damage and they frequently show that his skin is horribly scarred from the fire. I will take a second to say how ridiculous it is that he still has bandages on in the beginning of the film though. They put bandages like this on burn victims when the burns are fresh to protect the exposed skin from the elements, but I mean, 10 years in, I highly doubt that his skin wouldn't just be huge strips of mangled scar tissues by that point. It would be beyond healed and there'd be no reason for it to be bandaged. But I digress, let's get back to the ice. Now, since the 2018 version ignores part two, it doesn't need to be addressed, but in the original continuity in H2O, it definitely does. So there's no way to get around this without a straightforward acceptance of Michael being supernatural. Even if you hand wave the fact that Lori shot him in both eyes and bullets just don't stop there, so you'd have to assume that those slugs went to his brain, right? 
So the shape is capable of surviving two direct bullets to the brain. I guess you could maybe say that both bullets didn't go into his eyes and both shots grazed Michael's head, but not actually going in. And maybe, I, I guess maybe he was blinded by blood going in his eyes. It really doesn't look like that, but I guess that it's a possibility, but there's no damage to the mask. Then in parts four and five, we can see that he's fine, isn't blinded, and in part five, we even see his eye, and it's intact. It even looks like his facial burns healed up as well. So, over the course of 10 years, he's burned enough that he still needs bandages, but one year later, and those burns look like light scarring. The only explanation is that the dude supernaturally heals up using the power of the thorn, as much as I hate typing and saying that sentence. The answer is a little less clear with H2O since that continuity doesn't embrace the supernatural elements, so I'm not sure how Michael has his eyes back as well as not having any burn scars on his face or arms unless you want to take into account the whole imposter theory that the Michael in that movie wasn't actually Michael but a mere copycat killer. Maybe we'll talk about that some other time. Question number eight. For this question, we're actually at the high school that Lori goes to. Um, I can't get any closer than this due to that damn restraining order. Um, just kidding, they're actually filming something for real here, so I'm gonna leave them go and do that. Um, but the question I need to ask is actually about part five, because in part five, Loomis is kind of portrayed to be a little bit of a psychopath, but the question that I have is, wasn't he always? Let's look at part five for a minute. Loomis basically just shouts at Jamie all the time, physically manhandles her, and finally places her between Michael and himself using her as bait. It's not a good look for the doc, and thankfully he's treated a little more favorably in part six, but let's go back to the beginning for a second. His entire strategy for confronting Michael is to just like hang out outside his house all night with a gun. It's only after being there for a while that he bothers to look around and spot the car that's just been sitting there all day. Then, in the second film, when he's not shouting at people about shooting Michael six times. I shot him six times. I shot him six times. I shot him six times. An hour ago, I stood up and, and fired six shots into him. He just got up and walked away. Couldn't have shot him six times. He's waving his gun around needlessly and carelessly. He basically indirectly causes the death of Ben Tramer, a completely innocent person after pointing his gun right at him and causing him to run into the street. How he wasn't arrested for this, especially after it was real that it was never Michael to begin with, is pretty unclear, especially when Sam doesn't seem to show any sort of remorse for his role in the events. Then to further show just how unhinged that he actually is, he shoots a gun from the back seat of a car out the window, shattering it, gambling the lives of everyone in the car if the extremely loud son of a gunshot and glass breaking would have caused the driver to crash. Add to the fact that he blows up the hospital in order to kill Michael. Let's just look at this for a second. Michael is blind, two bullets in his skull somehow, and he can't see. Jamie has escaped the room, and Loomis is still in there with him. He doesn't know for sure if there's other people in the hospital nearby. He just blows it all up. And there's babies there. More than a couple of babies. I mean, you'd have to assume their mothers are there somewhere too, right? I know they don't show them. But it's not like moms just have babies and then peace out and say, I'll come pick up that guy tomorrow. The amount of innocent people that he could have potentially killed could have been equal to Michael's own rampage for all that he knew, but he figured it was worth it to take out Michael because let's face it, Sam is probably equally as crazy and a bit of a psycho. Question number nine. And here we are at the elementary school where Tommy gets picked on by some bullies and that bully gets picked on by Michael Myers. Um, we're gonna ask the question about number six because number six has some pretty questionable things happening in it but the most egregious one of all is that ending what is up with that ending let's look at it ant-man injects michael with reagent and then bashes his head into a pulp which looks pretty lethal but you know that it isn't and then everyone escapes 
but Loomis goes back in, claiming he has unfinished business. Then, all we see is Michael's mask on the ground, with Loomis screaming in the background. Now, if you're only familiar with the producer's cut, things are obviously a bit different. In that version, Michael is also gone, but Wynn is under the mask. I guess having switched outfits. I should mention Mikey didn't have his face bashed in this version and was simply trapped by the power of druid runes. It's complicated. Kind, kind of dumb. Wynn taunts Sam and places a curse of thorn on him while Michael becomes the new man in black. There's a bunch of gray area there, but not nearly as much as the theatrical cut, which doesn't really reveal anything, just that the doc has something to scream about. I should also point out that this ending was necessary because in the time between the original version and the reshoots, Donald Pleasance passed away and couldn't be a part of the action, which is why Sam is unconscious for most of that version. So as it stands, we can narrow it down to three options. The first possibility is that Michael was just gone, vanished, and Sam is screaming at the idea that he has once again missed a chance to end Michael's evil reign forever. Of course, just leaving the door open for another sequel. The second possibility is that the scream you're hearing is Michael killing Loomis, which obviously would have been handy if they had just made Halloween 7 instead of going with the reboot H2O route, as the Doc would have had to be out of the series at that point. His mask being on the ground doesn't really mean much in this version, unless it just got so glooped up he needed a replacement. The third option, which is the version I believe in, mainly just because this entry did wrap up the original continuity, is that the sound you are hearing is Loomis finishing the job, much like he said he was going to do, and finishing off Michael for good. The curse had been broken, the mask on the ground represents the end of the character, and this version of the universe is brought to a close with a final ending. Question number 10. For this next question, we're on the street where the girls are walking back from school and we get the whole speed kills interaction with Michael driving down the road. And we're actually talking about rebooting continuities. So H2O, does it actually do that? Or can it fit in the original continuity? There's been some debate about this entry actually being a part of the one through six universe using the car crash thing to link it. You see, in part four, it's revealed that Laurie Strode and her husband died in a car crash just one year prior to the film's events. In H2O, it's revealed that Laurie actually faked her death via car crash in order to go into hiding, so it's been floated that the crash described in part four was actually the crash that faked her death. No, put that theory away. Part four takes place in 1988, and Laurie's crash would have been in 1987. H2O takes place in 1998, and Laurie has John, who is turning 17, so he would have been born in 1981. Now, depending on who you believe, because Jamie's age differs from movie to movie, she's either 7 or 8 years old in Part 4, so she'd have been born in either 1980 or 1981, and since John was born in 81, it's more likely it'd be 80, so she's one year older than John, and they're really similar in age. So for this to be the same continuity, you'd have to assume that Laurie was perfectly cool with taking John with her and leaving Jamie behind, and then not really ever mentioning her again. When Michael shows up back in her life and talks about her past, she never mentions Jamie and doesn't seem to care about her well-being. And that's because in this universe, she doesn't exist. The continuities aren't linked, and the car crash thing is just symmetry between universes. I mean, unless you hate Laurie and think she's a terrible person because that's the only way this theory works. Plus, Jamie would have remembered that she had a brother that was younger than her. I mean, she's like seven or eight years old. She's not, she's not an idiot. Question number 11. And for this question, we're actually hanging out at Annie's house and we're gonna ask that important question. Since we're speaking about John, whatever happened to him? He's alive at the ending of H2O, but then he's never seen again. We never see his reaction to the events that follow, and we don't get to see how he responded to his mother being committed and then killed. Lori tells him to go far away before coming back into the school, but it's apparent that he didn't really listen considering both he and Molly are present when Lori steals the ambulance. Now, 
He's not shown again after this moment, but in Halloween Resurrection, this serial killer obsessed patient is giving a rundown of Mikey's history and he states that he killed four students at Hillcrest Academy in 1998. Not four people, students. Now, over the course of H2O, Michael does kill the two kids and Nurse Chambers and then Lori's boyfriend, Will, but Will wasn't a student and the three in the intro weren't at the Academy. Since he specifically states that Myers killed four students at the Academy, it would seem that we're missing two. So there's two ways to take that, and the first is that Michael killed both John and Molly while in the paramedic outfit before slipping away. Now, the other option is that they faked John and Molly's death in order to slip away once it was revealed that Michael was still alive, and this is the theory that I'm taking. Law enforcement on hand would probably have guessed that he would have continued to come after John, so they reported him as dead in order to continue Lori's ruse to stay in hiding. So in that continuity, John's probably still out there somewhere, possibly still rocking those ridiculous bangs. Question number 12. For this question, we're going back to the very beginning. This is the street where they do the establishing shot showing Haddonfield. And we're gonna ask the question, since we're speaking about the beginning of Halloween Resurrection coming from H2O, why didn't that paramedic just take the damn mask off? Okay, so the end of H2O was supposed to be pretty final, what with Laurie chopping off Michael's whole head and all. It's even more of a solid resolution than part two, really, but they needed a way out of it, and apparently that way out was Michael having a paramedic take his place and crushing his windpipe so he couldn't talk. Problem is, this whole thing doesn't make any sense, plus it makes Lori into a killer. Her stealing the ambulance to ensure that her brother is dead for sure was a pretty rash decision and was obviously frowned upon by the authorities at the school, but us, the audience, was on her side because we knew that Michael wasn't really dead. Having it not be Michael kind of makes her out to be an idiot, and her impulsiveness ends up killing some rando. Keep in mind, Michael could not have known that the chain of events would have gone this way and was just looking for an escape, and let's face it, the only reason things went the way they did is because everyone's dumb. I guess Lloyd's decision could be rationalized or something, but maybe instead of making the rash action then, she could have just done it earlier, right after LL stopped her from delivering a killing blow. <laughs> I mean, whatever, this whole thing is just... But this chain of events requires a paramedic to wake up from being unconscious, not try to make any sounds, because I, I know his larynx was crushed, but that doesn't prevent you from making any sounds at all, they would just be garbled grunts. And then he wakes up in a body bag and then slowly and menacingly unzips his way out and then attacks the person behind the wheel of the car driving him. And then, after the crash, and after he's pinned to the tree, he still just doesn't pull the mask off. He, he reaches up to touch it so it's clear that he's aware that it's on, but he just doesn't take it off. He makes no effort whatsoever to communicate what's going on, and come on, we know the real reason is because this was never intended to be anybody other than Michael Myers here, and this whole thing is just what the kids call an ass poll. but can we rationalize it? Well, that's what we do here, so, sure. Um, the shock and the trauma of the events, especially the crash, gave him a concussion, and the poor guy just no longer could comprehend what was going on, and his sheer confusion prevented his actions. That's all I got. Question number 13. For this question, we're actually at the other Myers house. This is actually the Michael Myers house from Rob Zombie's Halloween, which is actually still boarded up. Kind of spooky, I guess. Um, but we're actually gonna ask a question about the 2018 Halloween movie. Because I have enough questions about this movie to fill its own video. But the most important question I have is why didn't Michael kill that baby? Look, I'm just gonna say right away that the last thing that I wanna see is a dead baby. So I'm really, really glad that it didn't go that way. But for a killing machine made of pure, unadulterated evil, it seems like it should have. We know from earlier in the movie that Michael isn't shy about killing children as evidenced by the escape scene, and it's not like he doesn't see it as he looks straight at it. 
The director, David Gordon Green, actually talked about it and stated that it's actually an ethical choice that Michael makes and it's the one ethical thing that he does. But does that really line up with the character that they've created? Well, kinda. In terms of the series, we've seen Mike in the presence of plenty of trick-or-treating kids that he likely had an opportunity to kill and didn't. And the only times that we see him go against that is chasing young Jamie, his niece, who he was supernaturally compelled to kill, and the dancing kid, who was basically in his way as he was trying to get back to Haddonfield. So basically, kids are off the menu, unless they directly get in his way. The baby was in the crib completely harmless to him, so he didn't need to kill it. Bonus question number 14. Which Halloween movie is the best one? I think you knew this was coming. Stay tuned for Dead Last of the Halloween series where we're going to find out which is the best Halloween movie in just one week's time. So there you have it. It is 13 questions about a whole bunch of movies. Um, some of them make sense. Some of them do not. I did my best. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Let me know down in the comments what you thought. Uh, if you have any alternate answers to some of these questions, or if you have other questions that you want to see answered in the future. I'm sure there's enough material in the Halloween movies for me to do another one of these videos in the future. So let me know that down below. Um, just let me know in general what you thought, and like, and comment, and share. Do all that good stuff. Subscribe to the channel, please. If you have a chance, go to the Patreon page. It's right over here. Uh, patreon.com slash movie timelines these guys right here are my patrons they are awesome because they help keep this channel alive and help keep it going to bring content like this to you and i thank you guys for watching it and you know we'll see you in a little while for another great video thanks guys bye bye